you have to bear with me with this wind. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Over the past few weeks, I've spent much time reflecting on the time that I've had here at Miami and the experience that shaped my love for this university. I know many of you have been doing the same. There is no way we as first-year students could have ever imagined the personal growth we have all experienced from the day we walked down to Maled for Convocation to right now. The friendships we've forged, the knowledge we've acquired, and the life-changing experiences we've shared together while at Miami has made such a lasting impact on each of us. We are graduating in difficult times. Our, so our success as a society, a nation, will be dependent on the differences we make. What difference will you make? Miami has prepared us for this. The differences that we make and the successes we will have in our lives can and will be attributed to our time at this institution that we so love and honor. Our commencement speaker today is evidence of the success that we all strive for, at, at, that we will strive for after our time here at Miami. Originally from the Columbus, Ohio area, Will Haygood graduated from Miami in 1976, the first in his family to do so. He didn't leave Miami as a writer. He tried his hand at other professions first, but once he started reporting, he never looked back. And perhaps that's another lesson for us graduates. Will Haygood is an acclaimed author and journalist who has worked for the Washington Post since 2002. While at the Washington Post, Will covered the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina as well as Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. He has authored five books and is currently working on his sixth, which is about Thurgood Marshall. Mr. Haygood has also written about Sugar Ray Robinson and Sammy Davis Jr. He is a Pulitzer Prize finalist and has earned a National Headliner Award, Sunday Magazine Editor's Award, and National Association of Black Journalists and Other Journalism Awards, plus distinction for his feature writing in national and foreign reporting. He has also been an Alicia Patterson Foundation Fellow and a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow. Most recently, he received the Ella Baker Award for his reporting on Eugene Allen. The work that we will do in the future will always represent our Miami. We as Miamians must strive to be passionate about what we do, compassionate towards those around us, and we must never forget those who have helped us along the way. This conviction is similar to that of a little-known White House employee by the name of Eugene Allen. Mr. Allen, an African-American butler, fully understood that the way to be exalted was through service to others and humility. He worked in the White House for 34 years, serving under eight presidents. His story, brought to the public eye by Mr. Haygood in a 2008 front page article in the Washington Post, is the inspiration for the upcoming movie, The Butler, which will be hitting the silver screen this fall. The film will star such names as Oprah Winfrey, Forrest Whitaker, Jane Fonda, Cuba Gooding Jr., Vanessa Redgrave, and Robin Williams. Mr. Haygood serves as an associate producer for the film. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm Miami University welcome to our speaker today, Mr. Will Haygood. So the movie trailer was just released about a week ago. And friends have asked me what has changed in my life since the release of the trailer and the stories in the media linking my name to the movie. Not much, really. But I am curious about this. I have heard from both of the ladies who turned me down for the high school prom. <laughs> now these were not short letters. They were rather long. They were rapturous. One even had a poem in it. <laughs> it 
the essence of those letters were, Will, we always knew you would make it. Really? <laughs> because they teach us courtesy at Miami, I am going to make sure to invite both of them to the New York premiere. <laughs> Red Hawk Nation. <laughs> you look glorious. You look eager, you look ready, you look prominent as you should. I want to thank John for his fine introduction. I want to thank President Hodge for the very special honor of being here on this unique and historic day. Also, I'd like to thank the First Lady of Miami University, Valerie Hodge, who co-hosted a lovely luncheon earlier today for me. Allow me to also thank the Board of Trustees, distinguished guests, faculty, family members, and friends of the graduates. So as you heard, I am a very proud Miami alum. And it has indeed been a time of strolling down memory lane. I remember many days and nights here as a student. Actually, they're unforgettable. On some Friday nights, I'd leave my dorm room at Morris Hall and trek across campus to Martin Dining Hall. That's where we had many of our dances then with the lights turned down low. <laughs> I am delighted to salute all of the seniors and others earning their degrees today. Some of you may be heading off to the military to defend this great nation of ours. and you have our enduring gratitude. You're all quite special. There's one person, however, who has an extra deep place in my heart. My niece, Vanessa Haygood, is a senior, and she sits amongst you today. There were many times I'd call and visit her here on campus. One phone call stands out. It was her freshman year. I called and asked how she was doing. She said, Uncle Will, I'm in love. <laughs> I said to myself, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, as soon as she said that, I knew I was going to have to come here and meet this person. I saw myself hustling back to campus finding this person and giving them my, you know I'm a journalist and I live in Washington, D.C. and I know people who work for the FBI speech. <laughs> but before I could say a word, she blurted out, Uncle Will, there's a deer outside my window nibbling on a tree branch. I'm in love with Miami. I got a little misty hearing that. You see, I never doubted she would dig this place. I've been asked now and then during my travels where I went to school, what I majored in. Sometimes people would even want to know my grade point average. We live in an age where people want to know just too darn much about us. As to my grade point average, since perhaps inquiring minds out there might want to know? Well, let me answer this way. When the great jazz singer Sarah Vaughan was asked her age, she would go, 
Scooby Dooby Doo. And that's exactly how I responded when someone has asked me about my grade point average. <laughs> Scooby Dooby Doo. <clears throat> Miami is a very hard school. It is no joke. That, of course, is as it should be. You are expected to leave this elite institution today and take your mighty place in the world. So seniors, if you are graduating summa cum laude, I salute you. And if you are graduating summa cum lucky, I salute you just as heartily. <laughs> Allow me to share a few moments from life as you are about to embark on your wonderful and life-giving journey. After college, I returned home. I got part-time jobs, then a little job on a weekly newspaper, then a job at a social service agency. Finally, I had saved up enough money to go to New York City. I was 24 years old. I hopped on a bus. Writers, artists, so many dreamers, it seemed, were venturing to New York City in those days. I was going to be an actor. I had been in several stage plays in my hometown. Once in New York City, I moved into a YMCA. I flat out flopped as an actor. However, I had a Miami of Ohio degree, which was my cushion. I applied for a job at Macy's department store and got accepted into the management training program. I became a low level executive. I managed the towels and sheets department in the Queens, New York store. I was the cat. Mr. Scooby-Doo himself, who put the signs up that said, store-wide sale next week, 50% off twin and full-sized sheets. My mother told people I was running Macy's. <laughs> At Macy's, I just knew I'd climb the corporate ladder. It worked well until I got fired. The store manager liked me, but she said it didn't seem like my heart was in retelling. That probably had something to do with me hiding out in the stock room reading books all the time. She asked me to write an essay about what I really, really wanted to do in life. In essay, I said, whoa, whoa, where am I? Back at Miami taking an exam over at Harrison Hall or something? But I hunkered down that night and wrote an essay, hoping it would save my job. It was all about the beauty of working at Macy's and stacking all those multicolored towels and sheets. Ah, but she had my number, and the gig was up. I was being shown the door. Still, she saw something in that essay. She looked hard at me and said, you must go and be a writer. She was serious, too. So I wrote a newspaper publisher in Charleston, West Virginia, and got a job. That was really my launching pad. In New York City, at Macy's, I had failed. But I also got lifted up into the realization of what I should be, do what I should be doing in life. As you venture out into the world, graduates, you will come across some hard truths. I was no more cut out for Macy's than the rapper Jay-Z would be cut out for working on one of our beautiful farms here in Ohio. But I had discovered a truth about myself. The wind had pushed me toward the arts, and I would keep going in that direction. Adversity inches us forward. Go somewhere. Be brave. Take risks. Your dream will unfold when you don't even know it's unfolding. 
The roads that lead to revelations are not always laid out in the straightest of lines. I had gotten on that bus in my hometown. The bus might take you far away. Maybe just to the next town over. But physically or mentally, you have to get on that bus. In Charleston, I came across a picture, a small picture, wallet sized, of Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Some of you certainly have heard about him. He was a congressman from New York City who served from the 1940s through much of the 1960s. He helped write and pass the legislation responsible for federal student loans and grants. These were bills that changed the shape and course of our society. There was a time in this country when only the well-to-do went to college. Many of you have benefited from student loans and grants. I could not have come to Miami without them. My mom worked in the kitchen, one of those minimum wage jobs. So in Charleston, I put this picture of Pal in my wallet and told myself, someday, I'm going to write a book about that dude because I owe him. People laughed at me. After all, in Charleston, I was working on the night copy desk, editing the stories that the real writers on the paper wrote. I kept that picture of Pal and carried it around with me. Nine long years passed with that picture in my wallet. Nine long years of pulling it out of my wallet now and then, in looking at it. That's how long it took. Nine years to get that contract, to write that book about that congressman who helped me and many others get to this school. Later today, or tomorrow, graduates, ask for something from someone, your mom, dad, grandmother, uncle, best friend, that means something to you. It can be small enough to fit in a purse or wallet. Carry it around. Look at it now and then and remind yourself it means something special, that it set sail with you on this part of life's journey, that this memento, picture, heirloom, whatever you want to call it, took flight with you on this historic weekend in your life. I'm here to tell you, it is amazing how the small things in life that we tuck away can come to loom so large as the weeks, months, and years pass by. As you roll out into the world, people will attempt now and then to cut you away from your dream. That's the way of the world. In the eighth grade, I went out for the junior high basketball team and I got cut. I was devastated. In the 10th grade, I went out for the high school basketball team and got cut. Again, just devastated. And here at Miami University, I went out for the junior varsity basketball team and got cut. <laughs> it was a sad walk back to my dorm room at Han Hall. But after each time I got cut, I pulled myself up and I went to each basketball coach the very next day and asked for a second chance. Those who had made the team looked at me like I was off my rocker. They were whispering, what's he doing here? Doesn't he know he didn't make the team? Well, guess what? Each year in the eighth grade and in the 10th grade and even here at Miami University, I ended up being on the team, wearing a uniform. The same girls who said no to me at the dances clapped for me when I was dribbling down court with the basketball in my hands at Millette Hall. The truth is, no one can really cut away your dream. It is lodged deep inside of you. It is a force of nature. When you lose an opportunity, don't be afraid to circle back. Ask that person for a second chance. 
That's exactly what I did. Knock on the door again. Life is about second chances, but only if you ask. And know this, when someone gives you a second chance, you give grace to their life. You give them a chance to do something unique, something bigger than themselves, something quite special. They now become part of the long string of human spirit that pulls you along. They constitute that lone caravan of people who kept you on that bus. I will never forget those who gave me my second chances. So when I finally got going as a reporter, a writer, I just knew I wanted to write books. I'd ask newspaper editors to let me go interview legendary writers across the country and write about them. I wanted to know their trick, their formula, their bit of magic. How in the world did they write those 400 page books and keep readers interested page to page? I tracked down William Styron on Nantucket Island who wrote that searing novel, Sophie's Choice. I found James Baldwin in Amherst where he was teaching at the time. Baldwin, of course, had written about America and racial turmoil in essays that we continue to read to this day. In North Carolina, I sat for hours with the great Southern writer Reynolds Price who had written so movingly of his childhood. I found out from each one of them there was no trick. There was no magic. It was hard work. They told me the hard work gave them the feeling that they were doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing on this earth. Each of those writers did tell of hardships of running out of money, of artistic struggles, and yet none of that stopped them. They had essentially found their music in life. James Baldwin talked in sort of a jazzy rhythm. I told him at the end of my interview that I wanted to write books. I told him I thought about it night and day. But I was also scared, as I told him, because I just didn't know how I support myself writing books. I mean, heck, I was still paying off my student loans. But I also told him it was all I really wanted to do. I dreamed of it all the time. Of my writerly dreams, James Baldwin looked at me and said, you must go the way your blood beats, baby. And to that, I say, amen. Those authors I met out there across this country gave me courage. I adopted them in a way as my mentors. I sent thank you notes to them. I asked them for advice at critical points in my life. Your learning will go on and on after you leave here today. You can study those mentors. You are going to be amazed at how willing they will be to help, to offer guidance, to point you down this road or that road. As long as you continue to learn, you'll come to see that time is on your side. There really is such a sweet mystery to life, to time itself. Some years back, I stood on a sliver of grass in South Africa and watched a prison gate open. A man by the name of Nelson Mandela walked out. Having been locked up in prison and mostly unseen for 27 years, Mandela's so-called crime wanting freedom for the black people of South Africa. He had, on several occasions, been offered freedom. He could have walked right out the door. But since he could not get a guarantee that the brutal laws of segregation in place would be ended, he said, no, thank you. I'll stay right here. Now the people of South Africa, as you know, are free. In 2008, I found myself in the home of a frail elderly man in Washington, D.C. His name was Eugene Allen. He was born in 1919 on the southern plantation. 
He got offered a job as a butler at the White House in 1952. When he went to the White House, harsh segregation laws lay over this land. He worked there for 34 years. He told me it didn't matter which party the occupant of the Oval Office belonged to, Republican or Democrat. He said he worked for America. He said it was his duty to make the first family as comfortable as he could make them. He could have left the White House and gotten better jobs, especially after the social revolution of the 1960s. He could have walked right out the door, but he stayed and ended up serving under eight presidents, Harry Truman to Ronald Reagan. The night before the 2008 election, and just days after my visit to their home, his wife, Helene, told their only son that she was so very happy. He said, Mama, why? What's going on? She said a writer had recently came by and was going to write a story about her Eugene, her husband, and how that made her so happy because she always thought her husband's service to the country would be forgotten. They had been married 65 years. After telling their only son that her husband's story would finally be written, Helene Allen walked upstairs and went to bed. She died that night. One day before the late, before the election of this nation's first African American president, her husband, the butler, went to vote by himself. He will not be forgotten. Last summer, I was in New Orleans where we filmed the story of Eugene Allen's amazing life. Two men, Nelson Mandela and Eugene Allen, though in different countries, they were actually born just months apart. Two people who believed in something. Two people who went the way their blood beat. You must believe totally in yourselves. Never ever underestimate the power of that. No one else has what each of you brings to the orchestra. It has been said over and over that no man or woman is an island. I wasn't standing across from that prison in South Africa all alone. I had my dreams and failures and hopes all rolled up inside of me. I had this school with me. I wasn't in the home of that unknown White House butler alone either. I had every moment of my life up to that point with me. I am you. Just a guy who left here with his wonderful education and went out into the world and who tried to do his very best and who will keep on trying. And you know what? The actor who flopped in New York City made it to Hollywood after all. Imagine that, Mr. Scooby Dooby Doo on a movie set, a red hawk on the red carpet. The next time I run into someone and they want to know my grade point average, I'm just going to say I graduated from Miami of Ohio, and at Miami of Ohio, we rock. <laughs> you are going to do so much in life, so many wonderful things. Yes, the world does beat to its own drum, but you now are among those who make up the beautiful orchestra of humanity. Go make your beautiful music. Get on that bus to the class of 2013. For many, many, many reasons, I shall never forget you. Thank you and congratulations.